Welcome back to the table. Today, we are going to be talking about what we think, or what at least I think. I'm not sure about Ryan yet. Just might be the new king of gateway games. Yeah, so let's let's talk about this game, Cascadia. Now, we wanted to approach this a little a little different, not like a full-on review, but more talking about Cascadia's place, I think, in the pantheon of gateway games. For because sure. Because no matter where you think this game ends up, I think it would be hard to argue against it belonging in that pantheon. No, oh, for sure. This is definitely, um, if nothing else, the gateway game of 2021, I think. This is going to be on a lot of people's top 10 list this year. And it is probably the most gateway of those games that are going to pop up on, on those views. And we wanted to talk a little bit about why it is a gateway game and also why it is such a good gateway game. And spoiler alert, as you if you can't tell, we both really like this game. It's true. Uh, I mean, this is a very well done game. Now, with that said, it's not exactly breaking completely new ground. Not in gaming and even not for this uh, studio. No, that's true. I mean, the studio did have another game, Calico, which was, again, on a lot of top 10 lists the year that that came out. And yeah. I think Calico is still considered a gateway game by a lot of people. For sure. I think this is a far better gateway game than Calico, even though it does, it does basically use that same mechanic, drafting. You're drafting things, you're placing them in front of you. Yeah. But there's just so many differences between how this game plays versus how Calico plays. It just feels easy. I don't want to say easier because it's not. It's just it's easier in a different way. There's a little Does more freedom. Sense? Yeah, there's a calico. If you haven't played, has a restrictive feel to it yeah. because the puzzle that you're trying to solve, or the three different puzzles that you're trying to solve, are all messing with each other. And there's a little bit of that here. But a in calico, bit. you're building in a very strict area, which already feels a little restrictive. Uh, this one has the freedom for you to do whatever you want. Um, I guess the best way to put it is this game is more about easy to play, difficult to master than some of those other games. I think that's a good good way to say it because those games like Calico, you can find yourself in positions where you just can't even use any of the stuff in front of you. Well, and you can and, and you can make mistakes. And you can easily make mistakes. And yes, you can make mistakes in Cascadia, and we'll talk about that, but they're not going to ruin your experience. No. They might end up in a situation where you go, oh, well, I can't win anymore, or I'm not going to get as high of a score as I got last game. But you can... You can continue playing. I, I've never felt that frustration in Cascadia. Like I have not only in Calico, but other puzzle games like that, where you get to a point you're just like, I put myself in such a corner that I can't even get back out of it. And that can kind of ruin a gameplay experience for me. Yeah, and the interesting thing about these games too, and Calico, is they're different than other very uniquely different gateway games. That's true. And, and now all of their games, uh, flat out, they all have some similar DNA. And just to give you a brief overview uh, if you have never played this, and this is going to be maybe the briefest overview I've given, in this game, on your turn, you pick one of these and take both the habitat tile and this animal token. And then you're going to place the habitat tile somewhere in your environment, uh, and it doesn't even have to match up on the no, sides. You, you have the freedom you to put it wherever you want as long as one side's touching another. The only rule, really, here that you have to remember is with the animal token that also has to be placed when you take it, it must go on a habitat tile that has the corresponding icon. So there are some things to look for here, but you're going to be taking those in pairs unless you're using some abilities to do otherwise. I think you just nailed it. I think for me, why this would end up on my best gateway games or family way games or, or whatever you want to call them, because it's super easy to comprehend what you're doing. And setup is super easy. Literally player setup is take one of these tiles and place it in yeah. front of you. That's it. You place this down, you're ready to play, which is wild. And it's simple to teach. You can easily teach the game. Take one. That's it. Yeah, Take now one. you can teach people how to play it mechanically. So like I said, very very easy mechanically. Where the depth comes in, and this is the other good thing about a great gateway game, is yeah. easy to play and like I said, hard to master. But that what that means is it also is good for enthusiast gamers to sit down around the table and play as well. Uh, a good gateway game, in my opinion, is one that those enthusiast gamers really enjoy playing, as well as new players. And that's really kind of what takes gateway games up to the top of the yeah, list. And I think for a good gateway, those enthusiast players that have played Cascadia for, a, for you know several games, and those new players that are just starting, should be on somewhat equal footing. Mm -hmm. I think a new player can come into Cascadia and compete with an enthusiast gamer. I mean, it's you know probably you're not going to win on your first play. 
But you might. You might easily because it, at its heart, it's a puzzle-solving game. And if you're good at puzzles, even if you've never played board games before, if you can solve a spatial puzzle, then you're going to do really well at this game. And that brings me to another point I want to make, and that's about the relatability of it. Not only as a game, but also the theme in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, what Ryan just touched on is the puzzle aspect. And what I've found with all across all board games is a puzzle element is definitely one of those aspects of a board game that is more relatable to more right. people than other types of things, other types of mechanics. When there's a puzzle, like you said, everyone's built a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> right. Everyone's done things where they're trying to figure out the problem that's staring them right in the face, which in and of itself is a puzzle. And that's what this game's all about. And that brings you to the scoring cards, which is sort of the other thing you have to explain. But again, this explanation doesn't have to come first and foremost. You can just tell people, here's what we're doing when we play. They digest that, and you can say, and here's the things you want to be trying to do in your environment right. as you build it. You want to score with bears this way, elk this way, salmon this way. And it has a variety here so that the enthusiast gamers, when they get tired of these, can use other ones, use different combinations of them. And it really kind of turns into this game that pleases everyone at the table. Well, I mean, these, these cards are 100% where this game shines for me. Because yeah. there's still a puzzle to where you're placing your terrain tiles. Because you're, you're creating these areas of each of the different terrain types, and whoever has the biggest area scores points at the end of the game. That's easy. You naturally, when you're playing this game, even for the first time, and you're grabbing a forest, you want sure. to connect it to your forest. It just feels good. And it's intuitive. It's in, you're building out that little, you know, that little area. Like, it looks good on your map. It's very natural to want to do that. Yeah, no one takes the forest tile and say... Should I put this next to the desert? Right. Like, no one's doing that, so it's very intuitive that way. And like I was about to say, too, the other aspect of the game that I think is incredibly incredibly relatable is the theme here. Now, we've seen the, nat the nature theme quite a bit. Uh, yes. I, I, true. I want to say it probably happened before Wingspan, but uh, well, Wingspan, Wingspan was, takes a lot of credit. Wingspan was definitely the one that brought the nature theme into its current state right now, and it's probably one of the big reasons why this game has this theme. And it's for good reason. Everyone, no matter who you are on the planet Earth, can go, oh, okay, bears and fish and foxes. Right, and, right. Like, it's, it's something you can relate to. And it also makes a game, especially a gateway game, a little bit more enjoyable than, say, an abstract, purely abstract game like, say, Azul. Which, I think Azul is another... In fact, Azul is probably the one game, if anyone asked me about gateway games, I'd say Azul for the last several years. Yeah. Um, five five years it's been out, something like it's that? Been it's been a while, and I, I would say it's at the top of that list, games like Splendor as well. Mm -hmm. um, but Azul being so abstract, sometimes it's very easy for anyone to get a hold of, but when you bring a relatable element like bears and animals into it, it, I think, helps a lot of non-gamers or more casual gamers kind of get into it because they're not thinking in the abstract. You're able to think and look at this scoring thing and say, oh, so I just want a couple bears next to each other. I want a big, long line of salmon. Yeah. And then the other thing is, this game can be played, and played pretty well, if you just look at one of these, or maybe two, and go really hard on you them. Should, and, you and, shouldn't and you don't, try to score all of them. You don't want to try to score all of them, and that's generally what a new gamer is going to do. In fact, that's what I mean, I've mean. i done when I've played. I've looked at one thing and went, okay, I'm going to do it. Last time you and I played, you really focused on I salmon. Did. And if you focus on one thing, and then you can do a thing here and there, during those moments where you're like, okay, I don't have an option to add to my salmon points, then you look at another card right. and go, oh, well, I guess I could get a hawk and put it here for another point. You know, so it makes it very easy and accessible to sort of navigate those puzzles a little bit more than I think you can do in Calico and other games like that. Yeah, and I think that this is a game that's going to grow with you or you're going to grow with it because, you, like David said, you can use any of these different cards and there's even a family card for scoring yeah. that's really for like beginners and for families that just want you to group up the animals in little groups. And that's super easy to teach, super easy to, to visualize putting bears next to bears. And, you know, it's great to teach people the game, but then you're going to want to upgrade to these better scoring cards. And then when you start to really understand the game, you start to understand when you want to sacrifice a terrain placement for trying to score more on one of these cards or trying to earn what we, these Douglas fir cones as we, yeah. <laughs> as we realize that this is what they represent. These little pine cones, some tiles give you pine cones, which let you cheat the rules a little bit. And so experienced gamers will still see a lot of depth and you'll still have a lot of decisions where for a first time player, it might seem like, oh, the obvious decision for me is to take this tile, put the bear out and I'm gonna get some bear points. But if you play this game three or four times, 
you'll start to see that there are a lot more decisions hidden within this because sometimes triggering a pine cone one turn, even if it doesn't help you, can give you the flexibility later that you need to really score a lot of points. Uh, and speaking of these cones, what's nice about these two is this game is pretty fast. It's not yeah. like over in a matter of minutes, but it's it's pretty fast. Well, it's some matter of minutes. It is some ma matter of minutes. I mean, so everything's a matter of minutes. <laughs> but these cones, when they come out, it would be best to, as you're pointing out, these tiles that allow you to take one, which are on everyone's starting yep. tile and on these tiles, and suggest to everybody, hey, what this means is whenever you place an animal on that tile in your environment, you get one of these cones, and the things we've been doing on all of our turns, this lets you break that rule. So you don't have to take two in a pair. You could take one and then a different animal token. Right. And then all of a sudden, new players are like, oh. It, it gives them another exciting, fun, cool thing to learn about. And I don't think anyone's going to be you know, upset. They're like, oh, I wish I didn't know that in turn one. Yeah, and you know, I'm honestly like, when we approach any kind of thing where we're talking about games, part of me always wants to say, okay, well, here's the cons. I want to approach this with a critical eye. I want to look at all the negatives. Mm. And honestly, when I'm thinking about a game like Cascadia, it's difficult for me to come up with negatives because this is not a game, even like Calico, where you could get in some really bad situations. You can't really get in bad situations. You can always expand your territory. Yeah. You can always find a way to move things forward. And you can't really hurt other players. There's not a lot of like direct player interaction. Sure, you can take that salmon that I was you know, hoping to get, but whatever, that's the luck of the draw, the way these come out. And that doesn't really negatively affect your experience. I just, I have a hard time picturing somebody playing this game and then walking around out of the table frustrated. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, I don't see anyone being frustrated on this. Uh, but with what you just said about the sort of the hate drafting, if sure. you will, that can come into play. It's not a huge aspect of this, and I don't think it's going to happen to That's the point of be frustration. By, by table too. Table every table yeah. plays differently. Sure, but it is a nice aspect because I think I've played with some casual gamers who do like a little bit more of that spirit of competition. And once they've got a handle on I'm going after this, those moments, like I said earlier, where there's not necessarily a, an option for their salmon points. One of the first things they might look to for is like, what kind of points are you getting? Oh, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to get one of those now too, and it's going to prevent you from getting it. And that's always, you know, very satisfying for almost any player to do that. And it and it's not so harmful that you're going to get frustrated on the other end of it. Well, no, because everything you're doing is going to score you points in some fashion. I mean, you're you're always scoring points. You're building out your areas, and it's it's just really satisfying. I mean, I, I can't really put that into words I can explain, but but building out that map, kind of like people that have played Carcassonne for years, yeah. or Isle of Sky, there's just something about building out a giant terrain type that just feels really good. Oh yeah, and it sort of brings me to my last point, or second to last point anyway. When you're building out those areas, like Ryan said earlier, it feels good, and at the end of a game, even if you've lost this game, you've had fun building this giant right. forest that you built. You might learn at the end of the game like, oh, you know what, that didn't translate into points as much as I thought it was going to, but it is going to give you a lot of points. You know, if you just spent a lot of time like just looking at forests and maybe one of the animals, <laughs> sure. you're gonna have some massive point forest points and some massive points on that animal. You still may come up short overall, but that's, I think, going to just make people want to like, oh, I wanna try this again. And I think that's the, the thing I wanted to get at is, a good gateway game is a game that ends and people are interested in wanting to play it again. Yeah, I think for me, the reason that this sits towards the top for, for two things. Number one, I said this earlier, the ease of play for new players. Mm -hmm. You're just building out. It doesn't really matter what anybody else is doing. It doesn't really matter if you're maximizing your points. If you're playing with a bunch of people around your same skill level, you're all kind of doing kind of the same stuff. But if you want to really get in deep with this game, you're watching other players, like David said, to see what change they're making. Which animals do they need? How many forests do you have in your chain? Do you have two? Sure. Then I want to make sure I have three, right? And you can do that. You can play that game with that level of strategy of watching everybody's it's to areas, but you don't have you don't have to do that. The game doesn't require that by any you could score a lot of points without ever worrying about what's at your neighbor's table. No, but it is cool because this game, like many games, but this game does it well too. It teaches new gamers all as you as you play that you do want to pay attention because of this. If you're just focused on your own thing and you're like, okay, I need another fox, I need another fox, I need another fox. The moment a fox comes out and around the table someone else takes it is the moment that gamer goes, oh, so right. we can mess with each other because someone just took the fox and you get really, you're like, oh my gosh, I needed that fox. 
Um, and that's the moment that on their turn, they're going to start considering getting a little bit more competitive too. Yeah. The last thing I wanted to say, and Ryan touched on this earlier, there's not much going on. Player setup's just this, but the game itself is also not overwhelming to look at. I've sat down at the table with a lot of new gamers at times, even with something like Azul, honestly, yeah. or even Splendor. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot more information that they sit down at the table and go, oh, I have to digest a lot. Sure. You don't even have to put these cards out at first. You could basically keep these cards off the table, explain you're going to be taking these and building an environment with animals on it, and then ch -ch -ch -ch, hand out the cards and say, and here's how each of those animals is going to score. Yeah. The end. And yeah. let's get going. And it's as simple as that. Like, I, I'm, I, you said it's towards the top of your list. I, I think I'm going to go ahead and say, for me, Cascadia might be at the very top of the gateway. Because this is the new king for me in terms of gateway. Yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's hard to replace Azul. For me, Azul is a, is a game that I always bring out for new players. And, of course, you've got your, your Ticket to Rides, your Machikoros, your Splendors. Like, games like that that are, are really good at teaching certain Classic mechanics. gateways. Cla what, what I would consider classic gateways. This is, this is a new game, right? Uh, I, I honestly feel like in a couple of years... This could be another Catan or you know, another game where it's like, oh, yeah, new gamers at the table, Cascadia. Like, I, I could see this game becoming an evergreen title for them, even more so than Calico. Oh, for sure. This, I, I, I believe this is going to be a massively evergreen title. Um, I am looking forward significantly to playing this over the holidays with my family. Like, I literally can't wait to yeah. get this to the table with new players because I think this is the kind of game when you play it with those people, even if they're not board game enthusiasts who collect board games, this might go on their list of like, oh, I want to get a copy of that. Like that, that would be one I want to have here at the house for the family. So mm -hmm. that, I'm, is I'm our, with you. that is our thoughts on Cascadia. Uh, we'd love to know what you think if you've had a chance to play it because it is kind of hard to get a hold of right now, by it, the way. It is because it's, it's very popular. Everyone's wanting it. But if you had a chance to play it, let us know what you think below. Uh, I'd be very curious to hear some people's thoughts on like, no, this is a better gateway, and for these. Well, I mean, reasons. there are going to be people that will call this game too simple, and that's fine. Call it too simple in the comments, but that's okay. I think you call it too simple, I'll come at you. I think that that's perfectly <laughs> fine for a gateway game to be considered too simple by some p part of the gaming. Population. For sure. And you, earlier you said, could there be criticisms lodged at this? Yes, and if it is too simple. That'd probably be one of them, but that can always be fixed with more content. Right, sure. Right? I, I, I can see expansions replacing all these cards with the more difficult cards and things like that. So yeah. I'm interested to see what they have next. Yeah, so that is our thoughts on uh, Cascadia. If you get a chance, share in your comment, the comments below what you think. Uh, and as always, until next time, make sure everyone has fun at the table, and we'll see you then. Yep. Congratulations, you got to the end of one of our videos. Now, if you want more practice, just click on the video over here. It's another video. You might not have seen it yet, so click on it. If you don't want to do that, at least click on the subscription button below. That always helps us. And if you want notifications, please ring that bell.